This is Story Talk, a series of online conversations featuring storytellers and artists from different parts of the world, especially curated for the fifth anniversary of StoryFest Singapore. Today, I'm chatting with Australian storyteller Jackie Karen, based in Melbourne, on how she uses illustrations to interpret stories. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Carmony. Hello from Melbourne. So, Jackie, can you tell us a little bit about your background as a storyteller and how you work with visual artists and with illustrations? I came to storytelling via theatre, film and television, and I started telling stories sometime in, in the 1990s. So I've been telling stories for a long time. And uh, when I first began and was mixing with the storytellers in, in Melbourne, where I live, there were some ideas about not using props, not using visuals, that a real storyteller could tell a story without these things. But um, as the years passed, and the more I worked, I realized that uh, life um, and the place where I live is very complex, very multicultural. And um, I started to change my views and think, no, I want to use props. I want to use visual material in order to increase my efficacy, both in telling stories to adults and with children. I want to be an inclusive storyteller and not everybody audio processes words in the same way. Absolutely. And I think that's a very interesting point that you raised there about real storytellers not using visual props or any kind of uh, additional layers or any aids in our telling. Because a lot of cultures, if you look back centuries ago, always had some kind of visual representation. The storyteller was either narrating and making shapes in the sand or making markings on walls and on rocks. And then later, you know, there was mask work, there was there was um, buffalo skin leather puppets. So there was always this secondary medium that supplemented the story. So I do Absolutely. feel that, yeah, so I do feel that, you know, um, illustrated stories or visual storytelling blends beautifully with the oral aspect and the auditory aspect. And it's not something that we should worry about um, separating. You know, we should celebrate the fact that this is how it used to be told. And it's all right to continue experimenting and using different layers of visuals and illustrations, however, whatever medium they may be. Yeah, and and we all, we know that uh, we all process things very differently. Our brains are different. I often work with a musician. Now, when she plays, she visualizes. If she were here, you could ask her, you know, what do you see when you play this piece of music? And she she sees a story. Um, yeah. So and it's quite evident sometimes when we're working together and I'm looking at the faces of our listeners, whether they're children or adults. Children tend to be more transparent, so easier to read. You can see that they are visualizing. You work a lot with Kamishibai and we see a Kamishibai stage right behind you. Yes, there it is. Could you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit more about your practice using Kamishibai with storytelling? Yeah, I uh, first read about Kamishibai, um, um, well, I think way back in the, uh, 2010, and I was intrigued by the idea uh, because I love comic books and Kamishibai is related to comic books. And also... The, the longer I worked with my storytelling, the more inclusive I wanted to be and the, the more inclusive the audiences were, especially when you're working with children. If you go into um, a public space in Melbourne, you are likely to see children from many, many different cultures and linguistic backgrounds, children um, of different intellectual um, abilities and also children with various aids, like hearing aids, and uh, yeah. And I decided um, I'd left acting behind. I'd become a storyteller, so I could call the shots. And I thought, I I want my stories to reach everybody. And Kamishibai is just a wonderful, wonderful way to do that. Um, it can supplement your work. I keep turning around and looking at it. I was working in a um, in a venue the other day, and there was a child with. Um, cochlear uh, implants 
with her grandmother and her grandmother said she can't hear very much at all. She can't hear very much at all. And I could see the blank face on the child. When I told my first Kamishi Bai story, she locked on and I could see her processing the story. And uh, it was just wonderful. It was just wonderful. The stage you see behind me was built in 2012 by a friend. It's made from Australian eucalyptus. And um, I have stories which I've made myself. I am not a brilliant artist. I'm always want to emphasize that I just have a go. I don't let my lack of ability get in the way. But there are things that you can learn about Kamishi Bai that, um, that will, will help you, like the way the cards slide from left to right, for instance, and how you reveal the story. I'm also a huge collaborator. And um, yeah, so my I must have a stack of, of cards stories now like, like this, and some are mine, some are off the shelf, some I've collaborated with, um, with, with others, with artists. The one you're looking at behind me is a story that was developed um, by a group in Japan at the Atsugigata Tidelands Observation Centre, uh, where they have migratory shorebirds come and visit. And uh, we have migratory shorebirds here, ours travel to Atsugigata. This is a piece of work that they created to, um, to share with visitors, which is freely available online for educational purposes. What I want to show here is that you don't have to speak all the time. You can let the visuals do the work. Now let's see how this works. <laughs> here are the birds. Once again, they take to the sky. They fly across a vast ocean. They visit islands. but there are perils on the way. And some will not make it. So you've worked on many different projects, you know, with your Kamishibai work, as well as you know, with musicians, with different other kind of collaborative processes. So what are some of the challenges and difficulties that you faced, especially working in, with the Kamishibai technique as a medium to bring alive stories through illustrations? It's more like most artists, where's the money going to come from? <laughs> because any project takes time. Uh, you know, a story can take a year, like something like this can take a year, 18 months or if not longer to develop. And uh, yeah, this takes time. So yeah, the biggest challenge is, um, yeah, I think funding, which I think is a pretty universal thing. <laughs> so when you work together with a, a visual artist or someone else who's going to be the illustrator for a story that you are going to tell, what would be some of the difficulties in the process of developing this new work where you are an oral storyteller and the other person is a, a visual illustrator? What's, you know, what are some of the things that we can learn from your past experiences? I could show you another story. One of the biggest stories I've worked on in recent times is a, is a history story. It's a story about um, the movement of plants around the world, particularly in the 1800s. You know, I live in Australia, and yet we can eat bananas and pineapples here and we can pick roses, but, but these are not Australian plants. So how did they come to be here? So um, yeah, stories about the environment, stories that um, teach us about our past. So we make better present, better sense of our present, present uh, times uh, interest me. So this is a collaboration I, with my friend Lorraine Callow um that we worked on together now what we did is i did all the hard yards researching the story i look i just divide a page in two and i block the story in or well, first I, I map it out you know uh, he was born this happened and this happened and this went wrong and then this went right um and then i will break it into what i think are visual chunks and in the um other column i will will put ideas for the illustrations but that's when you sit down with your um, illustrator artist and and they will have ideas 
And I think uh, for me, one of the um, important things about collaborating is to respect your collaborator. So if you've asked someone to, to illustrate for you and they disagree or want to change something, must listen. <laughs> Do you have any projects that you've worked with where there's lots of illustrations in your storytelling that you'd like to highlight? Something that was, you know, um, a very unusual experience, something special or a story that you tell again and again and again because you have so much connection with the visual storytelling. And, you know, is there something special that you'd like to show us or share with us? Well, I think um, currently uh, this one would have to be one of my favourites. It's the most difficult story to tell, um, especially if I'm working with Sarah with the music, with the music because uh, I am limited in how much I can improvise, which, of course, as oral storytellers, we often do. We, we, we can see that someone's enjoying or the audience is enjoying listening to a particular part of the story, so you might, might extend it or you can see you're losing them there, so you... You hurry up a bit. <laughs> we we interact. I often say we don't tell stories to people. We tell stories with people. But um, when I'm working with Sarah, I need to hit certain cues. They're her musical musical cues, and so that, that has to be quite tight. So it's quite a difficult uh, piece to tell, but it is so much fun because everywhere we go, everywhere we tell a story, we see lights go on and people say, "I." I never, I never questioned when I go to the supermarket and buy an avocado or a watermelon or a lettuce or a broccoli or, or when I sit under an oak tree. I, I never questioned that. And uh, this is the depth of delusion <laughs> that many Australians have, um, you know, wiping the history of uh, First Nations people and what the landscape used to be like. So this, I have to say, would have to be one of my my favourite stories. Um, it's also uh, offered me some wonderful adventures. Um, you remember together we went to the Singapore Botanic Gardens Herbarium and I was able to share this story there. Jackie, what are you working on currently and what are you developing? What would you like to share with us so that we have something to look forward to? Well, with a couple of friends during the big lockdown, down that we had in Melbourne, I believe it was one of the longest lockdowns in the world, uh, we decided to make a podcast. We, just, we wanted to keep working and keep connecting and we've been recording stories locally at local events for, for many years and we got a small grant and we created a six episodes of stories and, and music. So we're going to round that up to 10. That's a little project that's happening in the background there. And that's been a fantastic experience for me because it's taken me into script writing, writing for podcasts and really shining the light on, on others, um, finding ways to weave the stories together. So that'll get finished off. And the other thing, I'm working with Sarah on another uh, project. This will be our third one. We've done Tales from the Flyway about the birds that travel um, the East Asian Australasian flyway from here past you and Sungai Bulo <laughs> up to uh, Siberia with, with that one. Then we've got uh, the story we tell about plants, which involves uh, the story that I showed you before. That's just one of the set. And now we're working on one called Paper Tales, which all the stories involve paper tearing, paper folding um, in some way. For instance, this is the story again. Many people will be familiar with this one. The story of the tailor who who um, who makes first a coat. All the paper tales um, are very very simple with um, things that people can go away and make and be inspired. So first he makes a coat, then he makes a jacket, <laughs> then he makes. This is a very edited version. Then he makes a vest. <laughs> then he makes. Then he makes a scarf or a tie. And then he makes a button. Thank you, Jackie. Anything else, Jackie, that you want to add before we wind up? You know, I have a particular interest in stories about the environment and stories about the past that shed light. On, on our lives today. Um, but because the story in the book of tales is about the lyrebird, I have to show you this. 
this is a lyrebird feather. I'll just turn it up. <laughs> lyrebird has uh, several different kinds of feathers, as all birds do, and this is one of the tail feathers. It's very, very old and beautiful. So I wanted to show you that. Um, I also wanted to talk about very briefly about um, the use of props and visual things. I've moved more and more away. In fact, almost completely cleared out my um, props from plastics. Uh, once upon a time, I never questioned using something like this. But now I just look at it as thinking, well, how long is that going to be in landfill? The other thing that I started to question on the theme of inclusivity is if I use an expensive uh, puppet that's been made from a factory somewhere in America or China, um, if I'm working with children, they, they can't have that puppet. So I try and make uh, and use things that they can really relate to. This is the old woman who swallowed a fly. She is made from a cylinder, a postal cylinder, postage, postage, postal, postage cylinder so when i show children that you can see them thinking oh, i can make that i can make that <laughs> or the other thing that is very popular is just a piece of string you can do lots of things with a piece of string um, i do sometimes use um, a little uh, hermit crab puppet this is a cloth puppet of course and i always after i've told the story i say this is a, a real one and over many, many, many years of storytelling, when I say to the children, which, which do you like the best? They always like this one the best. Thanks, Jackie, for making time. It's really nice to connect this way. You know, hopefully we get to see you in Singapore soon. Oh, well, I want to say um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this project. And a hello to all my, my storytelling friends in Singapore. I've been talking to Jackie Karen and how she uses illustrations for her Kamishibai storytelling. If you'd like to find out more about the different applications of storytelling, follow our video series, Story Talk, on StoryFest Singapore's YouTube channel.